Hi everyone, my name is Heather Einhorn. I'm one of the co-creators of the Curie Society. And I'm Adam Staffaroni, the other co-creator. We lead Einhorn's Epic Productions, a content creation house. The Curie Society is an original graphic novel about a secret society of scientists. In the book, we imagine that Mary Curie founded a clandestine society where brilliant women could pursue the farthest reaches of their intellect. This graphic novel follows three brilliant young recruits as they join the society. The Curie Society is fictional, but our book does have a lot of real science and factual concepts throughout. We worked with a panel of real working scientists and science communicators on all the factual information, and we're also working on educational materials to complement the book. We're so excited to introduce a panel discussion led by Nadia and the folks at Massive, uh, Massive is our partner on this book, and they helped make sure we got all the science right. Uh, the panelists are going to talk about the relationship between education, entertainment, representation in STEM, and what makes the Curie Society different. We hope you'll be as excited as we are for the book to come out on April 27th from EEP and MIT Press. Thanks for watching. In 1903, Marie Curie founded a secret society where the world's most brilliant women could pursue the furthest reaches of their intellect, the Curie Society. My name is Janet Harvey, and I'm a comic book writer. I, uh, I did a Batman story a few years back, and I have a Wonder Woman story upcoming in the Black and Gold Anthology. And I, um, my book, Angel City, is out from Oni Press. And uh, I'm very excited to be part of Curie Society. My name is Joy, and I am a career uh, STEM teacher. Um, in the last 10 years, however, I have added to my teaching, my science teaching, sociology and racial literacy. And so what that has done is it sort of forced me to sort of um, hold students accountable for social justice in the classroom in a way that's different than what I have always done. I think my entire career, um, has been about being the kind of teacher as a black girl that I didn't have and the kind of teacher that I did have. I had two black science teachers in high school, which was unheard of in the, um, in, oh, it's unheard of now. Yes, yes. Um, but certainly it was unheard of in the uh, 80s. And so it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, nice to meet you all. I'm Akasha Shemolinsky. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm also a technologist. Um, I am a product manager. I build healthcare technology currently at McKinsey. I also run a, a side gig around ethical artificial intelligence uh, and data analytics. So that's, uh, that's fun. Um, uh, the way I got included in this, uh, this fun piece of piece of work is through Nadia. So I, I joined on as kind of a uh, is it like a science advice? I don't know what the role is, but it was really fun. Uh, so I got to 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 join in the very beginning. We were talking about you know character development and the arc of the story and um, some really key components like the fact that scientists should work together and that really interdisciplinary work is is where we can all shine best because we all have different approaches. We're all taught differently, um, trained differently, and see the world slightly differently based on that training. Um, and yeah, I also um, do some work in film. So I, I worked on a short film that premiered at Sundance a few years ago, um, right before the pandemic. I actually got COVID at that at Sundance that year. So wow. I have really fond memories of that, of that Sundance. Um, but yeah, and continue to do some work in documentary uh, film making as well. I come from a super artistic background, so it's always like a joy to hang out with people who are very creative. My, my mom's work is there and then my brother's is there. Um, so I'm kind of like surrounded by it. I have none of those skills, but um, I appreciate it deeply. Um, and I also just have to say I uh, was such a science and math nerd. So to Joy, as a, as a STEM teacher, I'm like gr grateful for you and your discipline because it's like what got me through a lot of uh, tough stuff in school. So yeah, that's me. It's nice to meet you all. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Nadia Ortelt. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Massive Science and have been helping bring together a group of science advisors, including Kasha and um, a whole host of other really amazing folks who are working in STEM fields um, to help think through characterization. What does it mean to be a, a scientist or an aspiring scientist or somebody who's just curious about science? 
um, how does that get applied to problems in the real world and in this fictional um, world, or is it fictional? I don't know. Um, and uh, it's been really exciting and fun. So I'm, I'm really excited to also take the next step after the Curious Society um, book was finished, which is to work with Joy and two other educators to create a kind of educator's guide or compendium for the first book um, to help craft a narrative for how this book might be used outside of just pure pleasure and entertainment. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. This, one of the things that I really love about Curious Society, in addition to the fact that there's not a lot of graphic novels out there that um, that tackle issues of STEM in a way that doesn't feel explicitly educational. Um, but I also really love that the characters have a kind of depth that's often lacking in the depiction of scientists or young scientists. Um, and I like to assume that's because all the science advisors who came in with feedback on the characters really helped craft it. Um, but I also, I, I think um, the process of creating the storyline for Curious Society and thinking through those characters and what their story arcs and characterization arcs might be um, really led to this like amazing, amazing story. And it seemed, I can tell and feel that it's the first of many to come. Like they're at a nascent stage of discovering who they are, all the characters in Curious Society. And that's what is really exciting to me because their pursuit of science and engineering and math is kind of a part, inbuilt part of their curiosity about the world. And I like that, that it's not just, they're just like stamped with like a scientist identity and that defines them moving forward. Um, it's really integrated into, into just a generalized sense of curiosity. Um, I also like too that, and I wanted to actually ask all of you about, you know, what you think about how this book Although I can see how it might be marketed in some ways externally for girls, that it's actually not for girls, it's for everybody. And it just happens to feature, you know, female and non-binary characters. Um, and like why that's such an important thing, especially in a graphic novel that's geared towards this age group. So um, before, that's kind of going to be my first question, but maybe I can throw that to you first, Janet, since you were, you've were you been in, heavily involved in, in crafting the story and the characters. Yeah, um, about the characterization, is that is that really the question? Yeah, like why why is this book not just for girls? You know, why is this actually, even though it, f it features girls in the storylines or, and, you know, non-binary folks and, and, you know, people who identify in a certain way and that might be used in marketers to push it towards that age group, why is this book actually for, or that demographic, but why is this for everybody, you know, not just. I, yeah, I feel like, and I feel like younger people are are much better about this than our generation was as far as like kind of creating that binary, this is for girls, this is for boys. And I, I feel like this book is the characters, it's a book about interesting characters um, and their adventures and uh, who are also female or non-binary. So, um, but I, I feel like, anybody can can get interested in this book and get interested in the science of it and sort of the mystery of it and the the characters and, and their feelings and their arcs as they go through it. So um, I do I do think that it is it would be appealing for both girls and boys and anyone else. So yeah and Kasha when when we were talking about the characters and getting really excited about different storyline ideas, talking about uh, the Pleistocene and de-extinction and patents and like the complexity of scientific innovation. Um, we weren't really talking about gender identity so much, um, but that kind of like naturally came out of us, you know, in the framework of creating these, some of these stories or story ideas. What, is, what are your thoughts on kind of like, media or ent entertainment created specifically for girls or non-binary people or boys? Like, where does this sit in it for you as somebody who's kind of involved in the creative science? Line? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I feel like, you know, I, I, I remember when I was a kid and I, someone was trying to be helpful and they said something like, you can do anything. And I was like, wait, I 
didn't think I couldn't do everything until you just told me that I could do everything, <laughs> right? So, so the fact that you're saying it then to me makes me think, hold on, am I, is it actually the fact that I can't do everything? Is that actually the expectation is that I can't do everything and you're empowering me to feel like I can? And I think the same is true with storytelling where if it's not kind of explicitly there like for girls or for some kind of uh, demographic, that's just the water. And we need to have different flavors of water <laughs> that are out there. And, and we need to say, this is just a story about some really cool characters who are you know, learning science and learning how to do science together to save the world, right? And like, that's enough. Like, it doesn't also need to be, this is just for you, or this is just for you. This is just a different flavor of water. And no matter who, who reads it, they're just gonna think, oh, that is the norm for that universe. I think that's so important that people see that there are different norms, there are different flavors of water, and that um, it's not just like, oh, only you can go here and only you can go there. So I think it's very important kind of not to call it out because by calling it out, even if you think you're being helpful, it can actually start to seed some insecurities where people are like, oh, I had never considered that I can't do science or I can't do math because of my gender or race or whatever it might be. Um, so that's like my, my immediate thought there. I, I don't know if I actually answered your question, but that's, that's what comes to mind. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm always interested in how people, you know, think about this issue as to whether or not one should brand a thing as for a specific demographic because of that very reason. So I'm always interested and, and Joy, in your experience working as a STEM educator and a STEM teacher, what do you, what, what is your kind of, um, take on, on that framing device for Curious Society? Well, I would, I would combine both Janet's response and Kasha's response in that the beauty of this story is the characters from the very first entry on the page are human and they're multi-gendered and they are sort of engaged in all kinds of things. You have your naughty characters and your not so naughty characters. You have your I like to party characters and your well I don't really like to party. So the humanity of every character is represented there and that's the thing. I think when Janet said this generation of humans on the planet right now they don't they don't they they don't make a big deal out of the blue and the pink. They're like well okay purple. So um, at the end of the day, it tells a story of people who are like, yo, what's my party or, or what's my problem right now? And sometimes the party is, there's nothing to do. So let me see what I can get into. And then other times it's like, oh, wow, I saw this beautiful thing and I want to know more about it. Um, okay, that's science. And so what is so beautiful about this story is that you have all of that. If your problem is a social problem, there is a piece of that. If your problem is a, a problem of innovation and technology, there's a, there's a plot line for that. If your problem is really just sort of like within this structure of how does one generation reach the next generation, you've got that. So you've got a layered complex story and that's a human experience that is just gonna make it um, really, really accessible for anyone that picks it up. That's and I know, I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was jumping off of what uh, Dr. Joy said. It, there one thing that I know was important to Heather and that she really impressed on me when I came on board was that so many stories where there's a girl scientist, like there's one and she's the smart one and she's as smart as the boys and that's how she's defined. And we really wanted to have um, a cast that, that showed their full humanity and that, you know, where it wasn't just one personality, it wasn't just the smart girl. There's, you know, this one who's who's really curious and wants to prove herself. And then there's another character who's more, you know, into partying or into tech, or the, this one's really into fashion because she can be into fashion and also be into science. So um, we really wanted to show a range of very human characters so that it wasn't just like, this is the science girl, you know? Yeah, it's kind of like the, the privilege to not be tokenized. Exactly. You know, which I think a lot of us don't get. <laughs> so it's cool to have fictional characters who, who get to do that, you know? Um, Janet, I'm interested in kind of taking a step back and hearing a little bit more about how you got interested in comics and how like the Curious Society is different from maybe a lot of the other comic work that you have encountered? Yeah, um, it's really interesting because 
actually the first uh, I was just telling somebody the story the first comic that I encountered was when my mom brought home uh, the issue of Ms. Magazine that had the the first uh, adventure of Wonder Woman in it so um, and I was like very I was like five and I just was so excited about this I read comics as a kid um, you know and I was always really interested in like anything with a girl on the cover I which was not that many in those days uh, I was totally down to to read and so I always really liked that visual storytelling and I wanted to um, you know I, I it wasn't something that I thought of myself as doing I knew I wanted to be a writer but I didn't think of myself as being a, a comic book writer so um, so I I got into it that way and then I started getting into more underground comics in the 80s in in college and that was when I started being like maybe this is for me and and doing more like um that that type of comic and and drawing which I also do but not professionally um and I just really liked that form of storytelling um and then I started working at DC Comics as an adult um, kind of came back that way after being in more literary fiction. So it's it's always kind of been along the journey, but um, but the the traditional comic book um, industry, which is also where Heather comes from, I think we both worked at DC Comics at different times, um, has always been viewed as at least when I was there, it was viewed as very male dominated, and and it was very much geared at a male audience. Um, and I think that's changing a lot now um, the, between the book market kind of uh, taking a, a real interest in uh, graphic novels and um, and organizations like uh, the Valkyries. I don't know if you know them, but they're a group. Of, they were a group of um, of female retailers um, who got together and really started recommending certain books. Um, the The landscape changed a lot, and I think. Uh, Curie Society is definitely a part of that new landscape and is for a different audience than, you know, uh, your traditional DC or Marvel comics would be. And I, I really am excited to be able to bring that kind of a story to, to a new audience, so. And in a lot of traditional comics and series, women are depicted in pretty stereotypical ways, I would say, yeah. even in you know, Wonder Woman, which you're, you're talking about. And um, how does Curie Society like radically, it, what, how is it a radical departure from, from the traditional, mostly sexualized depiction of, of Yeah, women? well, first of all, it's not really sexualized at, at all. In fact, I, I think, um, and you see a wide variety of body types. You don't see like the super long leg, big boob, you know, Amazon women that you would see in like, you know, a Wonder Woman comic or a Red Sonia comic, or, you know, I, I love those comics and they have a place, but this is is definitely a much more inclusive view of, of and a, a less sexualized view of women's bodies. The art style is is really engaging. It's really appealing, um, and it it feels like more human. Uh, the, the the characterizations of the women are much more human and relatable. Yeah, and I mean, I think to that end, um, like even when Kasha and I and Britt and some other the science advisors were being consulted in the very early days about the experience of like representation in STEM, I think that had a big impact on the like initial drafts and the, you know, the material that was brought to you of like, what's the actual experience of being a woman, um, like a POC woman or uh, a queer woman or a non-binary person in STEM? Like, how does that impact the way in which you're being perceived? I feel like a lot of those initial conversations that were had kind of I can see that now in the final product. I don't know if like what that, how you think about that in terms of the the final sort of representation of all the characters. Yeah, well, I, I, I breathe a big sigh of relief. I mean, I'm, I'm not the artist, but I, I it's kind of like what Kashi said. It was, it's like, you don't, you, you don't want it to be like, oh, and here's a bunch of different, you know, bodies, but it's like, it's just there. It's, it feels like a real universe in that respect. Like there's, it's not a big deal. It's just, here are some interesting characters. They're different types of people. They're different body types. They're different races. They're different, you know, they're different personalities. And that's just because we're representing a broad range of people, not because, you know, 
we need to make a statement about bodies, you know, if that makes sense. Sorry, yeah. I feel like I'm rambling. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. It, it, uh, so I'm also curious too, because I, you know, this is my first sort of step into graphic novel land. I um, mean, into comics. Um, why start any project as a graphic novel first? I'm always interested in that. I mean, also because sometimes I'm like, oh, should this be a animated video? Should this be like a, an illustration? Should this be a written story? And so now that I'm like, oh yeah, there's this whole other format. I'm like, when should, why is Curious Society like good as a graphic novel? I mean, I know I think it's great as a graphic novel, but I'm interested in, in your take, Janet. Well, it's interesting that you, you bring that up because there's one page that I love so much. I like want to make a tattoo of it. And it, it's, it's the explanation of ecosystems and it's, it's a very, it can be a very dry subject, but the way the artist represented it was this circle of life, basically. And it's, it's a beautiful page. It's, it's the kind of thing that you can do really, really well in comics um, and that you can't do in movies or, or in fiction the same way because it's a, it shows a visual representation and it kind of walks you through stuff in a way that's interesting and engaging, but it's not, and it's storytelling, but it's also education, like it's like there's they're talking about how the wolves affect the trees and the trees affect, you know, the, the water and, and it kind of goes in this circle and it's just a gorgeous representation representation of an idea that I feel like you could only really achieve in that in that medium. So I, I think it's a I, it's used really well. I'm, I very much admire the artist for doing that page. So. Yeah, I think, I think there's something about temporality in graphic novels that is very yes. different from just like text that you would see or static images in a textbook right. or a movie or film where you're kind of like, if it, you know, if it's good, you're like slack jawed and kind of passive, but you're not like taking it in as much. Yeah, and movies really take they, t time as an element of the movie yeah. too, right? The pace or whether it's quick yeah. paced or whether it's slow paced. And with with this form of visual storytelling, you kind of, you're still doing pacing, but it's it's much more a, a paced by the eye than by actual the pacing of time. Yeah, um, I'm interested, Kasha, and you know you're a visual storyteller uh, as well as a film producer. Um, so you're working. You have worked temporarily in the past, like crafting a narrative that sort of just goes, and you just have to go with the flow. What's your take on? This kind of story as like as a graphic novel and and all integrating all the science into the the story in the way that it was visually. Ooh, that's such a good question. Um, well, this is the first graphic novel I've worked on, so I, I definitely can kind of see some of the differences between um, you know scripting a, a film or trying to script a documentary and failing because people don't do what you want them to do, um, and then you know writing something or being part of a, a project that ends up being a graphic novel. I, I really like the point that you're making about time. And I think that um, one thing that I love about the graphic novel format is that you can go back and you can look if you want to spend more time on one image or one, it's kind of like an infographic, right? Like if we're going to, if we're going to make it all tech focused, um, where you can really kind of dig into it and look uh, again and again, if it, if you are really interested in that one particular area and in particular, like this, this story has so many really lovely science elements to it that cross so many different disciplines, um, not just like tooting my own horn and the horn of others uh, who are science advisors, but um, I really commend the team on trying to find a broad number of examples that cross a number of disciplines. So you have everything that's kind of from physics and, you know, obviously it's like the, the kind of ant uh, colony swarming and you've got uh, a whole bunch around DNA and about, um, you know, de-extinction work. And um, I know the teams really dug into it and tried to get the science right. And so as a scientist, you can actually pause on a frame, right? And you can like dig really deep into that. Like there's a beautiful visualization too in the in the book that is about the ant colonies and how they all tell each other where the sticks are, right? And so, um, you know, I took extra time just looking at that page and like I was looking at it, you know, uh, virtually so I could like, I could digitally, right? So I could kind of like zoom in and be like, oh, interesting. Like I didn't know that, right? Cause I'm not a biologist. So I think that that's, that's one really big difference there is about 
you can kind of hit pause and and go deeper as a as a reader. Um, and on a film, you kind of you can hit pause, but you've just got like a flickering like image, right? So there's not much you can do beyond that to go deeper if you want to. Um, to me, that was kind of the the biggest the biggest piece there that was really different, and I I uh, very much appreciated um, having the ability to say if you want to go a level deeper on this, if you want to talk about encryption at a level deeper, you could like seed these like Easter egg style. You could put this in the corner. You could have this be something that you reference. And if someone's really interested, they can take that extra leap and they can dig into it and then they can go and continue the research journey. Yeah, and Dr. Joy, I feel like this is maybe related a lot more to your experience in the classroom of like providing something like, you know, Curie Society or another piece of media or information and seeing students or anybody, who, like any kind of learner kind of go off down a pathway. I feel like a graphic novel is like, is good for that pathway finding, but I'm interested from your perspective, you know, where do graphic novels kind of sit in terms of cool educational tools that you've, you've like come upon or realized that sort of exists in the world and everybody is engaging with. And then you're like, you know what, this is actually like a cool educational tool that I, I didn't really think of as an educational tool before. Yeah, in, in educator speak, um, it, it is, graphic novels are practically and beautifully differentiated. And by that, I mean, in, in, in pretty much, you know, a, a, a square, a four by four square, you've got 16 different stories because you can choose as a reader to go in a traditional path, cyclic path around the page or you can popcorn from one corner to the next corner and up wherever your eyes take you. And because they are all related and in conversation with themselves, you won't get lost. Your starting point is where you want it to be as the reader. And you know that there is some seeming thin line that connects them, whether that's the text or like Kasha just said, the hidden egg in the corner, which if you zoom in and say, wait a minute, which detail in this square is going to actually allow me to see this other rich thing. So it's like, whether it's just, it, it, like, it is an infographic, right? It's like, it's speaking to the visual learner. It's speaking to the artistic learner. It's speaking to the textual person. It speaks to all of that, including the, the relational person, right? Because the relational person may focus in on the characterizations. The environmental learner may be saying, oh, wow, I've seen those, that kind of mountain range before, or I've seen that, or I understand this, right? So every possible type of, of, of learner has a, a place on a, in a graphic novel. And, and so as a writer, I can only imagine um, the idea of a writing team packing details on those pages. It is like, unlike any other type of writing, because if you are doing some kind of academic writing, you're bound by the constraints of literary tradition that say you have to have lines that fit within this with these margins and whatever, right? But you don't have that, that jail, that, um, traditional writing creates, technical writing creates. And it's just like, and so when, when science teachers, especially science teachers, use the graphic novel or the visualization um, technique as the way to evaluate students' learning, it's powerful. Whether they're reading it, interpreting it, or creating it, how the student tells the story about what they know is powerful. So yeah, I, I believe in it. I'm a, I'm a believer. Do you think that that, like telling yourself a, a story as you're reading a story or telling us to reinterpreting a story and making it your own, is that kind of, is that part of the power just generally of fiction in any classroom, whether it's a STEM classroom or a language arts classroom or like- Absolutely. I think like what, what I go, I go like this. Science goes with fiction like peanut butter goes with jelly, right? And so in terms of 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could do just peanut butter and yeah, you could just do jelly, but man, how much better are they when they're together? Um, so the reality of it is, it's like what, what you're able to do is pull all the pieces in and then have students start to critically think, is this possible? And what elements of this fictionalized story are actually real? or could be real, or versions of something that are real. And then you say, hmm, because I'm thinking about the permafrost. Okay. Um, can I say it? Oh course? yeah, you can, talk, you can talk about the educator guide and, or like the permafrost example as one of the things that you're... Yeah, I'm like this. The permafrost, the permafrost example. I'm also thinking about COVID and I'm thinking about climate change and COVID and how SARS or, or coronaviruses in general can lie dormant in decaying flesh, be frozen. And as that frost disappears, that deer or sheep or whatever that died 10, 15, 25, 40 years ago that had a virus that killed it is now populating and in, impacting the living organisms that are in that same space. And I'm like this. And so it just makes you think, yo, wait, what? Right? So at the end of the day, when you understand that everything is a cycle. So to Janet's point about things, ecosystems, ecologies, there's no such thing as a border. Crossing what border? What you mean? We got one ocean. We got one universe, one atmosphere. We all suck it up somebody else's spit from around the way. So at the end of the day, you have to start thinking beyond the individual into the systems, into the collectives. And again, whether you're thinking about uh, expanding the size of your eye to include other people that are immediately accessible to you that you know, or the size of your eye to include sort of these broader systems, man, and it just, it comes out so beautifully. Um, and there are so many like little tidbits that connect it. Looking at the ants, for example, and that silent speak. How are the ants speaking? What? Wait a minute, and, and it's better than other representations that we've seen on film or in books about ants who speak, because this is a more naturalistic speaking that's real and authentic to the way the ants communicate, not how humans communicate in ant form where ants start talking. That ain't real. Yeah, you know I mean, it, although it was great, great movie. I'm not saying bumblebees and all of that that talk. That's good. That's good. But this this opens up a brand new set of like aha moments that I think again allows teachers and educators, whether they're in the formal setting or in an informal setting, to be like, so what y'all think? Because I'm sitting here thinking about Boys and Girls Club. I'm thinking about the why. I'm thinking about after school programs. I'm thinking about how do we get kids and families who their school experience has been wackadoo for the last year, who pick up something and be like, word, I could throw this thing you know, or, or whatever, you know what I mean? And so I think it is, it's, a, it's a perfect time for something like this to come out. And um, I'm looking forward to how the educators are gonna spin it so people can use it. Yeah, and I mean, along those, like thinking about it, like all these holistic options that are kind of contained within the graphic novel as a teaching tool. Can you give us like a little taste? I know we're still in the throes of making it, but a little taste of what like, you know, like the, the, the one of the educator guide activities or kind of things okay. are that you're creating, like a sneak peek. Yes. Okay. So here's a little sneak peek. And I, I, it was the funniest thing because one of the first stories um, was a character was like, oh my God, like you, you can almost hear her, oh my God, where she's like, oh my God, it, my, my sweater. And then she's like, 
you know, if you put hot water on that, you're going to secure the stain forever. Okay, I'm making up the words. But anyway, something like that. And the idea of color fast jeans and how, you know, you buy your jeans, you think they're wonderful because they only cost $10. But then when you take them off, your legs are blue. And you're like, wait a minute, how did my legs turn blue? And, and the whole story of fast fashion, color fastness, forming dyes, what sets a dye, and the chemistry of solutions. So I'm a chemistry teacher. And so thinking about it, we're crafting our lessons to deal with what we call Jedi framework, right? Jedi is kind of like, you know, it's been around for a long time in early childhood literacy around justice, diversity, um, identity, and activism. So we, we spun it a little bit, you know, because Jedi, science fiction, Star Wars, yeah, here we go. Um, but this idea that for the activity, we look at color fastness and the principles of color fastness in dyes where they're made, natural versus synthetic dyes, fast fashion in the countries around the world that make your clothes, especially the clothes that go to those $5 jean stores. Um, and then what does that do for the communities, the villages where the plants um, are harvested or the dyes are made? And there was a story, for example, about uh, an Indonesian village that was, the, the dye factory was flooded and how everywhere now the streets are filled with red dye. And I was like, <gasps> right? So this idea that we're looking at um, the real application of the science concepts um, and how it impacts others. So that's that justice principle, the size of your eye, the size of our we. Then we're looking at how then can we reproduce the activity in um, a formal or informal setting. So the for that one, I'm just thinking that's easy. You can look at food coloring and look at uh, cold water, hot water, look at paper towel that has, um, you know, the little grooves in it versus paper that doesn't have grooves. How quickly does it absorb? Is it absorbed? And when it's absorbed, does it separate the dye? Does it do something different? Um, and so it would be like the science behind chromatography taking mixtures that are complex, seeing how they separate, how do you have something that will cause it to separate better. Um, and so it's, it's really this fascinating chemistry idea, content-wise, the social justice theme that connects it to the broader idea that science is a solution to the world's problems. But when science creates more problems, we gotta do something as human beings, as a team working everywhere. And then finally, this notion that you get a chance to sort of see for yourself how to make it happen. And so that's the, the goal that we set for the education guide. Um, and I'm looking forward to my lessons. I'll be looking at color fastness, permafrost, and prosthetics as a, as a universal design element to deal with um, able-bodiedness uh, as my principle for justice. So it should be wonderful. I'm so excited about about how that's going to turn out and how it's going to be used. Um, so I'm going to just kick it over to you, Kasha, because I think, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about STEM as this exciting place and um, all the possibilities afforded in teaching younger people about STEM or giving them agency in STEM spaces to ask STEM questions. But also you and I have talked at length, um, even outside of our work with Curious Society, about how STEM is not a culture in many instances that is um, open or inclusive or diverse uh, or equitable. And so I'm wondering how you brought your experiences in sometimes really difficult spaces into the, the kind of advising you did for, for the story and characters. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm like really excited about those educator guides. So you're going to have to let me know when they come out. I can like, I can remember so many science experiments gone, I think, right, but I'm sure my parents would think they'd gone wrong as a kid, <laughs> in particular around dyes and trying to separate things. I had like those little pH strips that I just put in everything. And uh, I'm, I'm deaf in one ear. So like I've, I've been like wearing a hearing aid since I was a kid. And I like tried to construct my own headphones that would split so that it was louder in one side than the other. But like I mixed them up 
And so I you know, damaged my hearing, you know, temporarily when I was a kid. So like, I totally hear you. I think the way to really get to, to kids is through, and people is through things they're passionate about that really represent their interests. And that is like when people really come alive and they start to drive forward, not just doing science that's been done before, but really making the next push to say, well, how can we apply it over here? And I, and I love the realm of like social justice and just trying to understand how everything affects everything else. Um, so that's just like my first, like, I just want to respond to that because I think I'm really excited about that. Um, to your question about like the culture of science, I mean, um, I think probably I'm not alone among the advisors that you that you selected for this, that you invited to, to be part of this work, that a lot of us were drawing on our personal experience and trying to say, hey, if, if we have a hand in, in how science is represented to all the generations, but in particular ones that are coming up, like, what would we want to be different? Um, so when, when I was studying physics, I, I studied at Harvard and at the time our, our um, uh, what do you call that, president, our president of the college was out there saying publicly that women probably couldn't do science as much or as well because of some biological things, right? So this was Larry Summers. And, um, you know, you try to be like a, like a physics major, uh, try, to, try to just like pass your courses and like CNN is walking around trying to ask you things about, you know, what it's like to be uh, presumed like female in science, although it's non-binary. So there it's like double slight, right? And I think it's just, there's so, there's so much that I experienced as a, a young science student and a young scientist, you know, Harvard had buildings that were um, very old. They're beautiful. The physics buildings are really beautiful, but they didn't have any women's bathrooms. So they had turned every other floor's janitor's closet into a women's single stall bathroom by the time I got there, right? And so these things are like really ingrained in the kind of the buildings, like the physical architecture and also the social architecture and the educational architecture. Um, and as a student, you're coming up and you're just seeing, I'm not seeing myself represented in these places, whether it be as, um, you know, someone who is is not male identified or a person of color or, um, you know, kid of immigrants or whatever that might be. So I think like in terms of you know, trying to highlight some things for this story to bring it back around. Um, there are a few kind of components that to me were really important. Um, there were tropes about scientists that I really didn't want to see, you know, represented again. So there's always the lone hacker. It's always this like one smart guy who like is nocturnal and eats only pizza although you only ever see evidence of the pizza boxes, you never actually see him eat. And he's like a super, super genius. And it was like, we need to get rid of that. Like nothing's built by one person. Now one guy's name gets on it at the end, but it's never just one guy sitting in a room. And so, you know, to make sure that like the hacker character was actually pretty chill about teamwork, right? Eventually, and was willing to work with other people and blend their knowledge all together to make sure they were building something better. You know, the, the, the notion of collaboration across the sciences. I think one thing that happens a lot when people become, you know, more and more of a scientist is that they go deeper and deeper in one specific thing. And there's a lot that's lost there in terms of the interdisciplinary culture um, that I think is really important to build. And so when we're talking about representation, we're talking about not just genders and races and, and these kind of identity um, components, we're also talking about representation of different kinds of scientists and different kinds of science. So collaboration was a really, a really big thing to me. Um, and I think, you know, um, lastly, like this notion of, um, of failure, and the, the notion of, you know, to fail is a bad thing. When really as scientists, we get the pleasure of trying things over and over again and making it better all the time. And it's really a question of process. Uh, and you might, you might be looking for a particular outcome, but it's in the process where you get all that richness and all that learning that drives forward. Beyond that output, you now have a process that you can apply to other things. And so focusing in on, on that as well and failure not being seen as um, the end, but really the beginning, right, of the next iteration that will just continue over and over. Um, so those are some of the, the components that I, that I pulled out of like my own experience and also just what I would love the, the culture of science to, to morph into. Yeah, I think we had we had a lot of discussions about failure. I remember in those early meetings and how we were like, we have to we have to have failure in the story in some way, but not in a negative way. Like this has to be integrated because it's such a huge part. I mean, everybody I know who's ever touched science in in the sense that they were like running an experiment or just testing something, really like 
I think holds dear to their heart the first time they ever like epically failed because it was such a big learning experience <laughs> and and learning that it's okay and you can fail and then you just keep trying is is something that I think scientists take for granted actually so I was really happy to see it Janet like integrated into the story into a lot of storylines throughout in, in such a way that allowed the characters to still like live and breathe and be okay and learn from their failures and and from the failures of history too yeah um, I think I think like you know, in some parts of STEM or technology or science, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's really um, like encoded, you know, for example, debugging. Debugging is just like how you deal with failure, <laughs> right? Like bugs in the code. It's like a cute way of saying there's like something's wrong. It's not bad. It's like you're expected. It's an expected part of the process. And so I think highlighting that for, for young students or for anybody that it's not you know, if something doesn't work well, that's kind of expected. I mean, if it, if it worked, if it worked the first time around, I mean, you shouldn't get used to that feeling because like, it's probably not always, mostly it's not going to work the first time around, you know, and that's like totally fine. Yeah. And that, that was important to me too, in that um, I, I, narratively, like, how do you represent that, the discomfort of failure and getting past that discomfort, but also I feel like it was important to me because I feel like people from underrepresented groups also aren't always given the luxury of failing in when they're working in science or when they're working anywhere that they they're held to a different standard because they're seen as representing their group and so um, there's a lot of pressure to not fail and to and to represent well and so I felt like it was really important to be like hey failure is part of the process you're human you you can get back up from that it's not going to kill you you know what I mean it's not going to be the end of the end of your your road it's only the beginning so I felt like that was a really important concept to kind of to communicate but the kind of failure was really dope it was like we failed to crystallize as a team right and and it was sort of like it's still you know the that was the major setback right that for a moment, we thought that we were just going to be by ourselves and each of our individual efforts would be enough. When the reality of it is, it was the collective strength of everyone. And so I, I really like that. And so I think that's also cool in the way that the actual society is set up, um, that they're constantly going back. They're doing the retrospective. It's like, this was a shortcoming I had because I'm a product of my own personal history and the history of my society at that time so so we have only a couple minutes left i would love to just keep diving down so many of these conversational paths um but maybe we can do like a quick kind of popcorn to kind of close it out because we've talked so much about stem and characters and education and the graphic novel as a concept um but diving into this story, The Curious Society, I wanted to know who your favorite characters are <laughs> or who your favorite character is. And I can start. Um, and Taj is definitely my favorite character because I feel like I just really identify with Taj as kind of like really, she, she has like a kind of wild streak. And I like that she's just kind of a, she's like the hacker girl that I always wanted to be. And um, when I went to MIT, I never really had the guts there to be like one of the really like cool hacker girls who had green hair and who was just always kind of like coding constantly and like building crazy stuff and was like a double engineer like computer science and math major and that was always really cool to me and I just loved seeing her represented and also seeing her kind of like having to get over some of her like hangups and some of her personality um, traits that maybe prevented her from being able to work collaboratively so Taj is my, definitely my favorite. Um, what about you, Janet? <laughs> Who was your favorite? I'm, I'm really happy to hear that about Taj because she's one of my favorites too. I feel like for the girls though, it's really hard from, it's like picking a kid, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I love them all and I love them all for different reasons. Um, but Taj is closest to my heart in a lot of ways because I identify with her more than I think some of the other ones. Um, but I think my favorite one to write, and I just was talking to uh, Laura at Einhorn about this, is uh, Dr. Olvera, Ziamina Olvera, because evil geniuses are really fun to write. Um, but I, I also like that it's like her, her motive, and I don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't 
seen it or read it yet, but like, I feel like her motivations are really, she's really smart and her motivations are in a lot of ways really pure. It's her methods that are just completely twisted. And so I kind of want you to, to be with her when she's talking about what she wants to do and be like, oh, that's a really good idea. And then she's like, and this is how I'm going to do it. And you're like, no, no, why are you doing that? Like, no. So, um, so she's my favorite one to write, I think. Um, and I hope I get to do uh, more with her in the, in the next book, if there is the next book. So, so look out for more, more villainous, <laughs> villainous characters. Um, what about you, uh, Kasha? Oh, uh, I think that for me, I really liked uh, Dr. Burkhardt because um, she's kind of, I think this like struggle of do you work from inside the system or do you like try to burn it down is like a really, um, a really uh, common struggle for me. <laughs> and I, I have, stand, I have like kind of stayed inside the system for the most part sometimes. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's a real struggle for a lot of scientists because a lot of, I mean, not to like, not to get serious, but like a lot of funding comes through existing structures, you kind of can't get away from them. Uh, and so there's just that question there about, you know, do you try to work inside or do you try to go outside? Uh, so that'd be my favorite character. What about you, Dr. Joy? <laughs> Can, can I take the cop-out answer? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I don't have one. I'm like, when I, honestly, I was like every, the girls themselves were really fun. And so I can't choose between them. And then the mentors, I'm like, because I could see my own mentors. So like, I want to low-key say, here, here, if I had to choose, I'm not going to choose any of the main characters. I loved the fact that there were these random college co-eds that were on campus that were just annoying. <laughs> well, I like that because I think, what do you do with those people? Because they, are all, they always seem to be there. But in many ways, when you do science, you're working for them too. And so I'm like, I, it was hard. I don't know. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I love that answer though. I think that's great because I I never thought about I didn't think about like all the random coeds as a character, but they are because they're the context in which the curious society exists. And so, um, yeah, that's great. I love that. <laughs> but I just want to thank all of you, Kasha, Janet, Dr. Joy, for coming and basically just chatting for forty five minutes about curious society. One thing that I just want to tell everybody who's listening and who's um, stuck with us through this awesome conversation is that the book is coming out. You'll be able to order it. You'll also be able to check out the amazing educator guide that is a compendium to the book. Um, Janet has been working on writing this book with the Einhorn team for years now. <laughs> A long time at least a year yes at least a year um and uh, we've been sort of ideating for much longer around the science and we've been working on on all of these um aspects of the educator guide for the the past months now we're really really excited so please tell us what you think tell us who your favorite character is um we're really excited for people to actually start reading the book what do you say are you in the Curie Society, a new graphic novel from Einhorn's Epic Productions and the MIT Press, in bookstores this April.